captured by women is brought to you by yum vita a delicious way to grow we will never ever run out of issues to discuss because every week there's always something dramatic or scandalous happening on the political scene or in the current affairs domain. This week has been no exception. And today on Captured by Women, we're going to be discussing several very important issues that have been trending. Very importantly, we'll be looking at the issue of Anas and his mode of operation and collecting the data that he does in his very interesting and investigative pieces. There have been conversations around whether or not his modus operandi links into the breach of privacy of the individuals that he investigates. And so we're going to have a legal practitioner as well as the president of GJA in studio to discuss this with us. Of course, we have the very unfortunate incident that happened at the Obingfo Hospital, and of course we have to talk about it, so we'll be doing just that. But interestingly, we'll also have a very exciting career woman who's had a very interesting journey in her career, and she's built an industry in the fashion industry. And we'll be looking at lifestyle and the issue of cosmetic surgery and how that is affecting women and people generally in Ghana. You don't want to miss this show. The show has been brought to you by Kind Ketsi of Yamvita, a delicious way to grow. And I'm doing this show today with Nanama and we'll be right back after this break. Stay tuned. They have to once solve the technical problem before they come out. Because many people want to register. Because there are foreign, foreigners in the country of which when it is uh, voters' time, they do, they do vote, which is not correct. So I feel the identification authorities should verify and know where the technical problem is before they come out. Um, for the identif identification card, that's what majority of people do. No, my form, somebody like me, when I go to the bank, Hardly do I use my voter's ID card, but for this one, anywhere I go, anytime I do carry it along. So they pushing us here and there. It's very frustrating. It's very bad. It, it baffles me myself. It baffles me because it's been postponed one, two, three times, four times, even up to five. This is the fifth time it has been postponed. So we don't know now. We are all, everybody is waiting for it. Yes, if, if it, it will, they will fasten up whatever it is, it's technology problem. So let's, I hope they will solve it as early as possible so that all of us will get it. I also think, to my point of view, when it's been done once and for all, I think it will help all of us. Because going to the bank, you being asked a card, you don't have, it's also another problem. So I think if they do all together, it will help us. But they're postponing going and coming, I think that too wouldn't help. So they should do something about it for us. It will help all of us, it will benefit us. We want to assure the people that well, if the problems are, they claim is technical, they should deal with it quickly and, and, and return to work. So the anxiety among the generality of the people will be assuaged. Otherwise, then we are beginning to read that it's an agenda that they are seeking to set, to torpedo the process and cite other reasons. Well, so we saw your views and heard your views out there. I guess the idea is the same. Everyone wants that card to come to pause, but maybe the government should just take its time to make sure it's rolled out properly. No, no, the, the whole conversation about mm. the Ghana card, I think, is a very big one right. with a lot of issues. Okay. The delay is mm -hmm. one, and I'm beginning to think, I remember we did a registration some years <sighs> ago. I went and I queued and I did everything and I was giving a slip and mm -hmm. that has <laughs> accounted for nothing. But then the, the fact that every time we, we hear that there's a new date, we are all excited about it. It's wrong, mm. plain and simple. We can't be communicating to the public that we're going to do something of public interest right. and then we keep coming back with, mm -hmm. with issues. And right. for me, the, the most worrying part is we haven't really been told what, what? the challenge is. Well, they don't, is it, it's they either they don't point. know, they can't pinpoint mm -hmm. it, like That's what exactly is the issue? Mm. They're fixing the issue, but they don't know what they're fixing. Yeah. I mean, and this is taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. For every day we miss with a deadline or something like that, it's money that we're losing. Yeah. So what is the issue? Mm. There's some allusions to the fact that maybe there's something with the, the previous contract or right. something that, that the current regime is, is trying to fix, mm. but they haven't told us. 
we should be clear about it. Exactly. Then there's also for me the big issue of the costs. I mean, it's do we have 1.6 billion CD dollars actually? I was to about do to say, did you just say CDs? No, 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 no. And, and I'm thinking, if that we're talking about huge, old Ghana CDs, then, it's okay. then we would have said in Chi, <laughs> open, pay, 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 pay. It's outrageous. Do, can and we really afford something like that? You don't know what like you're that. using it for. When you don't even know the problem, how do you fix it in the first place? And I, for one, then it comes to the question, do you think this government is just rushing things? That idea of wanting to, you fulfill know, fulfill all, all the promises. promises. Yes. But Petra, you see, at the end of the day, it's not just about a, a party you know, playing politics with us because it's the taxpayer's money. It comes yeah. back to bite us in the backside. You take all this money, you throw it down the drain, literally, because for us as we sit here, we don't know what the problem is. Mm -hmm. We're fixing something. And my problem is when the vice president and the president got their cards, does it even is it functional? No, is those, it are, those were actually temporary those, cards. I think exactly, they're just models to see because they're supposed to do And for them, ones, yeah. they even, the big man of the land has a temporary one, which now for the regular people, we're having a limbo was it a waste? Was it just a show? Let's get real with these things. I, for one, I'm not looking at the speed or the rapidity with which MPP fulfills the promises. But so far as at the end of your four years, you're able to do substantive things where things, we all yes. hold on to it and say, indeed, in the year they were able to do the national identification card and it works for us. It's able to access this, 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 this. That in, alone is enough. Yes. I don't care why you do it in the last month just before exactly. your party. Exactly. At the end of because it, you would have gone yes. through the right processes, mm -hmm. got everything right, and I can trust you. But when every day you're giving me different piece of information, yeah. that's yeah. an issue. And it seems we, we tend to think in terms of four year, four or eight year cycles. Yeah. And so we're measuring ourselves by what we did in the second year, what we did in the third year, what we did in the fourth year. Did mm, we no fulfill? No one cares when it comes to the voter. Exactly. But the, the challenge with that is mm. we're, sh we're very short term in how we're mm. planning. And we have to have long-term plans. And so this whole firefighting approach to solving problems, mm. we find a very quick way to solving right. it, and it's not sustainable. It really is just going to hurt us mm. in the next 10, 20 years. Mm. Because there was a conversation on social media last week where a friend of mine asked a simple question that, does anybody know what our plans are for health care, for education, for security, in terms of 20-year plans? No. And the consensus everywhere was like, no, they're four-year plans. Mm -hmm. There are eight-year plans that we read in party manifestos, but really, what is the sustainable plan? And identification is so basic, but it has become like a very big issue for us. How many, of, how many cards do we carry about? So, you, so have a, you, you have so many cards, and this is supposed to be like a solution, mm -hmm. but we, we really, we're, we're not even sure mm -hmm. where we are with it. And, and even as this card was coming about, someone was asking, can we just synchronize all the information mm -hmm. before? Because every time we're saying, we have oh, to go when to the another national process identification again? card comes, it will be like that. But before then, right now it's in limbo. Can't we start other processes to take all this information? Because Petra, the annoying thing is filling the forms. You fill forms over and over again, but still they ask you on everyday basis. The same Can I have your information? And yeah. I'm thinking as papers, you're going to throw it away. Why can't we just go technological, put everything, input the data, make sure it stays there. I don't know how it gets off the system, but let it stay there. Let everyone have access to it and let it be centralized for everybody. Well, I guess MPPs, <laughs> one of the things they want anyway. to achieve is the issue of being paperless. So let's hmm. hope that this, even though there, there are issues with it, mm -hmm. it would sort out itself we since it so. seems that no one really knows what the <laughs> problem is and we'll get it fixed. We'll take a break. We'll be back with more here on Captured by Women. In 2013, two of Ghana's very fine journalists, Seth Kwame Boateng and Manasseh Azuri Awuni of the Multimedia Group, carried out an investigation around the Obinfo Hospital. And that investigation led to some action by the Ghana Medical Council to close down the hospital. Unfortunately, five years down the line, we've had reports of a very unfortunate incident in which a very young lady has lost her life. And the allegation is that this was by malpractices at the Obinfo Hospital. Today, we're going to be looking at the law and especially what the Medical Council can do to prevent such a recurrence in the future. Joining us to discuss this, we have Mr. Foley, who is the head of the Public Law Department of Gimpa Law School. And also we have Dr. Eli Atukwi, who is the registrar of the Ghana Medical and Dental Council. Thank you very much for joining us in studio today. So I've already began um, the conversation around the incident of the Obingfo Hospital. Generally, maybe I should start from the, the, the council side of start things. The law, the law side of it. 
<laughs> I think I'll start from the council side of it because we know the hospital was closed down that and then it was opened. Yeah. And then the law side of it would then be that was there a lacuna in the law that allowed that this should happen five years down the line? Yeah, yeah you see, um, why were the institution closed down? The institution was closed down because of issues that, we, uh, that had come that we had received reports that irrespective of the fact that the individual had not renewed his registration with the council, he continued to practice. We are really not going to talk about the earlier issues at, uh, for which his registration was uh, suspended or he was suspended for three years. But the issue that led to the closure was that we were receiving reports, the individual had not renewed his registration with the council, and he continued to practice. So on two occasions, the institution was closed down. But as to the circumstances that led to the reopening to, of that particular institution, I think I want to be silent on that for now because uh, the council is coming out with uh, detailed information on the activities that went on uh, sometime either Monday or Wednesday. Right. Yeah. But Dr. Tipu, let me come in and also ask, because people's confusion is the fact that mm -hmm. he is a doctor. And yeah. so for them, why is there so much noise about the fact that someone has died in his hospital? The f well, if it was closed down, he reopened, people were going, then someone has died. Deaths happen in all hospitals. So why is this particular one a big issue? Yeah, you see, uh, you're looking at the fact that, look, you are a doctor. Mm -hmm. You've qualified as a doctor. Mm -hmm. You trained and qualified as a doctor. But the law requires that each year mm. you renew your registration mm. now if you had not renewed your registration and you continue to practice then you are doing that illegally mm. and the law really has prescribed certain punishment for you know things like that okay. and the fact that that institution is known to the medical and dental council because that wasn't the first time mm. you know there had been issues since 2003 is he a surgeon is he allowed to do the particular role he's playing, he's playing yeah. Well, he is not a surgeon. Okay. He is a general practitioner. Right. Yep. Mm. In his case, he said he did a program for two weeks mm. in Florida. And uh, we thought that was also uh, not right. Mm. And these were some of the issues for which the institution, uh, we decided to seek the closure of that particular institution. Mm. Whose role is it? Medical and Dental Council as a regulatory body has a role for the doctor. So he's not fit to practice, and so they, you know, mention it. At what point, if he reopens, is it their role, the police's role, the law's role? Whose role is that place? Right. So we would have to look at, um, you could say, some collaboration between agencies. Okay. Yeah. Now, I I heard Dr. Tipi earlier on in the in the week, mm. you know, and giving us some background, which also helps us as lawyers to analyze the issue. Right. He had a complaint. Mm. Um, he had an issue. He was brought before the council, right? He was not happy with the council's decision. He appealed, which had a certain legal effect, right? Stayed the council's decision. Yep. But he also went into another territory. License expires. Mm. And for us in the professions, um, engineers, doctors, lawyers, whoever, you see, the renewal of license, and again, let's go back to the philosophy behind it. Mm. Exactly. It's not just a question of come every year and your paper mm. is signed. Mm. Exactly. You need to establish and prove that you have grown exactly. and that you are fit to continue practice. Right. And so there is, there is a process. For the lawyers, I know now there's talk of um, even seeing how many pro bono cases you've you done. Mm. So the moment you go into the non-registration, you've slipped quote unquote, back into some illegality right. if you work. Mm. Ordinarily, let's be frank, the police may not have that on their mm. scheme of things right. to check <laughs> who is operating illegally. But I believe, um, I think you mentioned it, that some complaint had been made. You had drawn the attention of the law enforcement agencies. From there, I think the council has done its part. Right. Thank you. Then it's up to the law enforcement agency mm. to take over, okay. you see. And perhaps that may not have been Hmm. Done. But is that the case? Is that what we see in Ghana? Because Obinfu's case will not be the only one. Exactly. There are many where we've, you know, people have complained and it's been yes. closed down and they find some dubious ways of opening. So on the law side, who the police has to keep, you know, exactly. that work in check where exactly. the person is closed for as many years as is demanded. So when right. they say they don't have, you know, the information, 
isn't there, you know, that open space for people to act dubiously? Yes, I believe they have the information. Mm. And in the good scheme of things, mm. look, any death that occurs in a hospital under 24 hours or yes. in a home, mm. you know why we have that coroner's inquest? Right. It's to check mm. whether the death has occurred as a result of some illegality or, right. natural, or it's a natural death. Exactly. So you see, there even the it, it, the issue leaves the jurisdiction of the hospital mm. more into the law enforcement and justice system. The right. coroner's inquest is <laughs> done by a judge, mm -hmm. technically. Mm -hmm. you know, and perhaps, sadly, in Ghana, maybe we all go through the process of just filling that inquest. Mm -hmm. But there must be, it's an inquest. Mm -hmm. There must be certain questions asked. Mm. And I know a bit of the medical protocol, even when a death occurs, they have certain checks they go through. Yeah. I once spied something in the surgical <laughs> block in Kolibu. They have a checklist yeah, to come to the conclusion that, yes. So <laughs> <Inclusive. Inclusive. laughs> <laughs> you see, that a death has occurred. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also important the law enforcement agencies follow up on these mm -hmm. when they get the information. Mm -hmm. Because when you have to satisfy yourself, as in this case, mm. that a crime has been committed, you need that vital first few minutes or first few days information exactly. Exactly. occurring as a result mm. you know okay so dr ellie um, alluded to the fact that issues with this hospital started in 2003 yes we had the investigation in 2013 and we're in 2018 yeah. is there a gap in the law that allows this operation to continue in spite of the actions of the the yeah. dental and medical council there is no gap in my humble view mm. there was a breach what is missing is action the issue here is that the law enforcement agencies are not enforcing the law that makes the operation of a medical facility without license a criminality. Well, not, okay, so let's look at it this way. Mm. Not necessarily gaps, but perhaps education. Exactly. And I, I'll again go to collaboration. Now, you mentioned mm. crime. I'm not too sure whether the act there makes it a crime. What you call a crime that will bring in the police mm -hmm. Is another matter mm. but yeah. as to it being some infraction mm. or some violation of the law yes definitely mm. you know if the person's name is struck off i believe sometimes there's publication right. there is. and that publication serves as notice to everyone exactly again yes let's go back to the members of the public ourselves mm. once that publication is gone out then we need not engage. But Dr. Foley, we know that publication is going to like the backside of the newspapers, very small and print. Is there a way that the public would know? Unfortunately, yes. not everyone reads. Well, read. Not all Agreed. Not everyone. Yes, not copies. everyone reads. Mm. They are, they are, it's, it's in circles. The, the problem goes wider right. and wider, right? But even in the immediate mm. scenario, um, hospitals have premises mm -hmm. and all of these things. Exactly. There's a police station close <laughs> by where all these <laughs> things <laughs> occur. Yes, you would expect a certain proactivity. I know my police friends would say, we only act on the basis of a complaint. Mm. Yeah. So maybe you want the council to come and make a complaint. And I believe they do. We yeah. had, yes. we had they, really done that in this particular case. Mm. You see, that is why I'm saying that sometime this week, mm. either Monday or Wednesday, yes. we really coming out with the full details right. of what had happened over the period right. so that the Ghanaian public would know where the issues were. And okay, has there been a, been a precedent in the law on a case like this, and how did it end? Well, not, um, I'm not aware of it. Yeah, yeah there had be been corrected. a case yes. uh, at that. Okay. Yes. Um, you know, he was also suspended over a period, and then he filed an appeal. Mm. Yeah, and that for a period, you know, there was an automatic stay until the appeal was determined mm. or was heard. Yeah. Anyway, it's been an interesting discussion, but time will not allow us to go more into it. But we have been speaking to Dr. Elia Tipui. He's the registrar of the Medical and Dental Council of Ghana, and also Mr. Edmund Foley. He is a lawyer and the head of public law at GIMPA. We'll take a break. We'll be back with more here on your favorite Saturday show, Captured by Women. So let's go into the discussion of talking about Anasi's number 12 video, which is set to premiere on June 6th, and everyone will be thronging there to watch it. But the implications thereof, and really the criticisms that have gone down, people are saying maybe the way he goes about his journalism is faulty, or maybe he's actually breaching the law on privacy of the individuals he does investigate. But to delve into this matter, I have Mr. Edmund Foley. He's a lawyer, and he's the head of public law at the Gimpa Institute, and also Mr. Mr. Roland Afelmoni, he is the GJA president. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good 
afternoon. So I'll start off with Mr. Money asking about when we talk about investigative journalism, is Anas really playing by the books and going by the rules in the way he's working? Um, indeed, there are no clear cut distinctions okay. between um, mainstream journalism and uh, investigative journalism. Um, the only line of demarcation is um, the style. Anas has a style which um is innovative mm. um which um summons a lot of bravery which um um it's something which until now was unprecedented in the history of journalism in this country um it is instructive to know that uh, his style of investigative journalism is a subject which is taught in american universities right. article 13 of our uh, code of ethics um France on um, using authors means dishonest means to gather information. Mm. But all this will be wholesome if they are tampered with public interest mm. uh, considerations. Mm. So the question is at the end of it all, do his pieces of work? serve the national interest right. or public interest? If the answer is yes, then then all applause for Anas. Mm. And the answer is it's an emphatic yes. Mr. Moni, let me mm. not catch you, but let me invite <laughs> Mr. Foley to get in because you mentioned something very instructive, that if his works are impactful, then, I mean, let's let matters rest. But people are worried about the means in which he gets that impact across. And that's where we come to the legal stance. Right, thank you. So from a legal standpoint, um, the kinds of investigations he conducts mm. are into matters which um, offend our criminal laws. Okay. You're looking at corruption. He's investigated um, cases of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, we saw children being abused. So these are acts of criminality. Now, you would ordinarily have expected the law enforcement agencies to do what he does. Mm. They have been given the um, powers of investigation to do that. The question then arises, does he have a legal basis for more or less taking over the work of the police? Mm. As a citizen, and for all of us, um, at, uh, Section 18 of our Criminal Offenses Act requires us to report a felony that is happening in our view or which we reasonably believe mm. is about to happen. I think he proceeds from the perspective that there are certain issues of criminality in the society and therefore he goes underground and I think he might be covered by the Whistleblower Act. Mm. Um, so he goes underground, gathers his information. Mm. You may have a problem with the way he gathers his information, but what he does um, in law in policing mixed with um, criminal law. We have people we call agent provocateurs, okay. which is somebody who is deliberately planted. Where Anas may have legal challenges is okay. whether the police have deliberately planted him. Right. Okay. So I think he chooses to be an agent mm -hmm. provocateur, mm -hmm. goes out, digs, and brings the information. Okay. Right. For the people who are affected, I believe he comes and makes a suggestion. Mm about some act that is bordering on a crime. When you acquiesce in that act, mm. it's a bit difficult. It doesn't lie in your mouth to say that, oh, I didn't know I was being trapped. Mm. If the suggestion being made to you, you ought to make an independent determination yourself mm. to say that, well, I think um, suggesting that I part with money for some illegal mm. purpose is not right. And I think he's been proved right when some of the people he's tried to trap mm -hmm. did not yield. Okay. Right. So um, you, I think um, Mr. Money made mention of the fact that the issue of he's doing it for the impact on society or yes. for the greater good. On the side of the law, what's the, the opportunity in that? Because one of the conversations that has gone on a lot in the public domain is, like, he's, like Mr. Money said, what he's doing is impactful on society. He's helping us expose something very important, a, a canker in our community. Yes. Does that cover him? Right. So just before we got into the studio, I was sharing some thoughts with Mr. Moni that we need to look beyond the letter of the law to its spirit. Mm. And I think he's trying to bring out some aspect of that spirit of okay. the law. 
So for those who may argue against him, mm. you can do so from, for us lawyers, we call it a very positivist stand, what is written mm -hmm. in the law. So what is posited or what is written might make some of his methods unorthodox. Yeah. Okay. When you look at it from the impact point of view, you're connecting law with development. Mm. So this is a gentleman whose work is trying to get us to change mm. our ways. And to that extent, we would have to engage with that function or role of the law. The late right. Professor Modibo Okran mm -hmm. wrote extensively on this, how the law should help us move, not just become a barometer for measuring mm -hmm. our behavior or activities, mm -hmm. but it should lead to change. Right. Okay. Mr. Foley, let me ask, I mean, for those who are investigated or yes. who threaten to sue Anas and all these, do they really have a case? If we're saying overall because his pieces bring impact, he's allowed to go scot-free, do they then have a case to go to court? Especially when you think about <laughs> the law of entrapment. Yeah. Is yes. he compelling them mm -hmm. to do what he knows is wrong, but Just trying to, to find them. evidence? Mm -hmm. In my humble legal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very having humble watched, at that. Yes, <laughs> having watched some of his pieces. And I think he, he has a legal background himself. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you observe the nature of his entrapment, he always more or less offers the person both an opportunity to fall as or well as time. an exit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So that if you mount a legal challenge for entrapment, which would, I mean, border on illegality. You need to establish that the person coerced you mm. in a certain direction. Mm. But where his work suggests that he makes, he makes the reference mm. to something, okay. he creates a fact scenario, mm. right? Mm. And I believe he proceeds from a certain suspicion that the people he's going to investigate might fall. Okay. And so when they mount the legal challenge, I think they may have a bit of a, a difficulty. Right. Yes. But anyway, let me come back to you, Mr. Moni. Mm. I mean, the final thing is, considering the fact that Anas has broken, you know, barriers with the, this kind of investigative journalism, what is the GJA doing to support him and also support others who would decide to go into this field? Because we know in Ghana it's pretty mm. difficult looking at some of the challenges he's gone through, even having to mask himself. What will GJ do in subsequent future to help people in that field? Uh, GJ has a number of occasions rewarded him mm -hmm. with our flagship um, uh, crown that's the best journalist in Ghana. I believe that also catapulted him from um, um, national um, pedigree to the international one. So um, the number of rewards we, had, we have given him have all vindicated but what is done mm -hmm. uh, over the years, nationally, internationally, um, is all achievements, literally of them, and have all vindicated the rectitude mm -hmm. of his um, uh, selection mm -hmm. as the best in the country. You know, the and the GJ was at the pinnacle of professional awards. Mm -hmm. I know a number of people who have won the GJ awards, and that's uh, and, and that have catapulted them from from ordinary levels to uh, maybe managerial positions. Right. I know a couple of them. Okay. And in the case of Anas, um, we, again, we did it to um, um, Komalai Dumont, mm -hmm. who became the biggest, uh, one of the biggest international brands, again, uh, who, were, who were subjected to all mm -hmm. kinds of uh, bashing. Again, were vindicated. So Anas, yes, we will support Anas 24-7. Um, I had a conversation with him yesterday, mm. and I did assure him that you can count on our support, our uh, rock solid mm. support in this instance and, and other instances which may emerge from the controversy. Mm. So, Anans is one of us, uh, we are proud of him that uh, he's, as I said, and the best repeating, mm. he's one of the purest, if not the purest gems Ghana has ever produced. Very well. And on that mm. note, we have been talking about the criticisms of Anas's number 12 video. And I guess the roundtable discussion is the fact that his pieces don't contradict the law per se. And he also doesn't contravene any law surrounding the journalistic code of ethics. So I guess we're all there saying kudos to him. June 6th, we will all be at the screening or the premiering of this video to watch what comes out. But anyone who has done anything, maybe it's time for you to come out and confess right before the time. <laughs> we'll take break we'll be back with more here on captured on career woman today we'll be celebrating selena beb 
who is the founder and CEO of a very interesting African accessory brand. She's had an interesting journey and she started off really not having any experience or knowledge of her industry and what she does, but she's grown her business. You don't want to miss this part of the show and I'm sure you'll pick a tip or two from here. Please stay with us. Hello and welcome to Selena Beb. I am Selena Beb Akumensa, a fashion accessories designer and a fashion entrepreneur as well. Here at Selena Beb, we produce and sell African inspired accessories from handbags to footwear to jewelry to tab cases. We've got you covered. It's your one stop shop for all your African inspired accessories. All right, so Selena, you told us about yourself, but I think you left out some part of it. Um, the fact that you're a trained journalist. Yes, I am. I'm a broadcast journalist, mm -hmm. and uh, at the moment, I'm freelance. I'm not working with any particular media house, but you know, I'm open for work. <laughs> mm. yeah. Yes. So that brings me to my next question of how uh, you transformed from, from being, being a journalist to a fashion accessories designer and coaching and all that. At what point did you do that switch? All right. So um, I actually didn't start just from journalism. I actually set out to be a lawyer. I actually studied a lawyer. Law. Yes, I studied law in the UK. So I was an aspiring lawyer, but I abandoned that because that wasn't really what I wanted to do. So um, after my undergrad, I decided that media was what I wanted to do, you know, broadcast journalism in particular, because I love talking. So I moved back in 2008 and I was trained by GBC and I worked for GBC Radio Unique FM for three to four years. Then I moved to Radio XYZ in 2012. So it was when I was working at Radio XYZ in 2012 that I started designing to start my own fashion brand. Um, and it started this way. I've always loved fashion, especially accessories. You know, I love bags. I don't know why, I just love bags because I feel no matter size what no matter what size you are, you can use whatever bag you want. It's not like clothes that, mm -hmm. yes, if you're a certain yeah. size, you might not fit into a certain um, design or it's a particular a type size. of dress. But with bags, whether you're slim, big, medium, any bag at all, you can use and you can rock them. So I love bags in particular. And I love particularly the African print bags, the made in Ghana ones, because I was fascinated by it. I, I'm like, how can you make mm -hmm. bag in Ghana? Because when we were young, we knew that all bags came from abroad, you know? Mm -hmm. So I love the African print bags because it was different from what I was used to seeing abroad, you know? And so I started buying them, using them, and there was a lot of interest. People loved them. Uh, my family and friends would want to store them for me or ask me to buy some for them. So I realized that the market was there. And being a handbag lover, and mm -hmm. also I had a secret dream of mine that one day I have my own handbag brand. So I thought, okay, why don't I start? Because back then when I was thinking I would want to do handbags, I was thinking pure leather bags, because I love pure leather bags. I just love the smell of the leather and the good quality bags, you know. But when I saw that ah, the African print bags are involved, people like them, I thought, okay, let me try. I could fuse the leather with the print, you know. And so that is when the design came about and I started dreaming about it and I dreamed so much about it and then it became a reality. I just mm. thought, let me try. Let me try my hands at it. Yeah. Mm. So, so many people find themselves in different types of jobs or mm. careers and some, some of them are not really enjoying it. They have some desire or passion within them that they wish to pursue. But so many issues, so social, family, economic and all that. How was it like for you transitioning from uh, being the lawyer, abandoning that dream, coming back to communication and general limit, and then now uh, fashion? So the transition was very challenging, you know, um, because first of all, I set out to be a lawyer. I was an aspiring lawyer and then I abandoned that. I went into communication. I was doing well on radio. So nobody understood why I wanted to now go into fashion, but the fashion industry was calling. And I felt like that was what I was truly meant to do, you know, so I wanted to try my hands at it. And nobody really believed in me. You know, it was just my sister and a few of my cousins that encouraged me, you know, like, why don't you try it? You know, try it and see how it goes. After all, if you don't succeed, you can go back to, you know, working on radio. So when I started, I was still working on radio and doing this alongside, and I had no idea what I was doing. In hindsight, I look back and I'm like, I had some nerve, you know, the audacity <laughs> to actually go into something I had no clue about. I just had a natural flair for fashion and I had good taste in picking up bags and accessories, but 
I had no training in fashion. I didn't know how to sew a bag. I didn't know how to cut buttons. You know, along the way, I've learned it now. But in the beginning, I didn't. I just had a natural creativity and talent for it. So mm -hmm. I had ideas. I had the kind. I had a, an ideas of what I wanted to. Um, how I wanted my bag to look like or how I wanted my products to look like. So I had to find a team of workers who put it together for me and it was hard. Working with Ghanaian artisans is not easy, you know, but um, I, I, I managed to overcome those challenges. Some of them are still challenges, mm -hmm. but day by day it gets better. Mm -hmm. Does it, it mean gets better. everything is done here in Ghana? Everything is done here in Ghana, yes. Um, the raw material, some of them I buy from outside Ghana, but the African prints, obviously, I get them from Ghana, but the hardware, like the zips, um, the labels, the locks and accessories for the bags, mm -hmm. I have to um, import them from outside. But they're all put together in Ghana, all handmade right here in Ghana. Mm. So fashion comes yeah. along like something that is a woman's thing and so people will not be surprised if you're doing well but you being in especially starting as a novice you didn't know anything mm -hmm. about it and now i even see you adding shoes and all what is the reality is it because you're a woman and so fashion just comes to you naturally or what is the reality when you entered no fashion doesn't just come naturally to you just because you're a woman I mean, what do you think? Is it every woman that dresses well? No, no not everyone looks put together. You know, some of us um, know how to put things together better than others. Some of us have better taste when it comes to fashion accessories and fashion clothing than others. And so I'd like to think I'm one of those that actually knows a, bit, a little bit more than maybe the average woman. Mm -hmm. So just because you're a woman and you love fashion doesn't mean you can be a designer. No, you actually have to have, you actually have to be creative. You have to be extremely creative. You have to have a very imaginative mind. Imagine what kind of designs you think people will like. Because I am inspired mostly by the everyday woman, my customers. You know, as the interview was going on, you saw this lovely lady that walks in. I would look at such a woman and I think, what would this woman want to hold? So I make sure I design something for everybody because my customers, my target market is actually women aged from 25 to 85 which practically means all women. So I make sure I have something for someone, a 25-year-old, a 35-year-old, a 45-year-old, and it goes on and on. I make sure that when someone walks into my shop, they'll find something for them. So you actually have to have the flair for it. It's not just because you're fashionable so you can become a, a designer. No, it's not that easy. Mm. Trust me. <laughs> so in the face of these challenges, how impactful has it been? Are you fulfilled? Do you feel happy doing this? Or is like, well... I don't have a choice. I entered and so I should be in. What is the situation like for you? Oh, the situation right now, like I said, some of the challenges are still there, but we try to overcome them. But I am so, so fulfilled. I'm so happy doing this work. You have no idea. There's nothing better than seeing someone holding your bag, especially when you put it on social media and they tag you and say you're rocking my Selena Bear bag. That just makes my day. Even if I'm having a bad day and I see someone on social media holding my bag or wearing my shoe or any of my accessories, that just makes my day. I love it. I love it so much. Um, I still love the journalism. I still hope to be able to host my own talk show mm -hmm. and become the Selena of Africa instead of Oprah of Africa. <laughs> you know. But um, I'm loving this fashion thing so much that I've even giving up my uh, my day job which was working on radio to concentrate on this because this has become my main job now mm -hmm. it's amazing um so many accomplishments i hope to accomplish more things but i've won so many awards um i don't mean to brag but i just like to drop a few yeah, I, mean, you you know, I was voted <laughs> um, the accessories designer of the year um, by Glitz Africa in 2015. Just last year, I won two international awards in Italy at the Global Women Inventors and Innovators Network Awards. Um, I've been interviewed on the BBC. I've been on Focus on Africa. So this fashion brand has taken me... They've t it's taken me so further far than that journalism I... Yes, might have taken further you. than journalism <laughs> probably would have taken me. So apart from the guts, with which you you ventured into this yeah. what else does it take to be up there determination perseverance hard work and you should have the natural talent and creativity for fashion so how has your gender as in being a woman also influenced in your success in the industry a negative um i don't think it's having any negative influence and i don't think it's 
it's giving me any advantage either. I think people just see me as a designer, to be honest. I don't think people see me as, oh, she's a woman designer, so let's feel sorry for her and give her this opportunity. And I don't think people also feel like, oh, she's a woman, so she can't do this, you know. Um, my accessories, I, I cater for both men and women, so I do stuff for both men and women. Wrapping up, mm -hmm. I would want your advice, motivation, encouragement for people out there who are also um, nurturing certain desires and passions and dreams but are scared of making the bold step, sometimes because of circumstances around us and even society. Okay. Um, I mentioned determination before, so you have to be determined. First of all, make sure that whatever you want to venture into, make sure that's what you truly want to do and make sure you're capable of doing it. Because sometimes you may like something, but you may not be good at it. You know, I wanted to be a doctor when I was very young, but I wasn't good with the sciences, so I had to move into the arts. So make sure that you're good at whatever you want to venture into. Um, make sure that you can make money from it, okay? And forget about fear. So our shop is located in Usu. It's Selena Beb. It's down the Photo Club Road. Um, just two buildings before the former Radio XYZ and also adjacent to the former African Market building. Our contacts are 054-345-9000. That is 054-345-9000. Email selinabeb at gmail.com. So on Lifestyle Today, we're in talking about cosmetic surgery. Well, now everyone seems to want to change a part of themselves or probably almost all of themselves. And that's very worrying because we believe that God created in a certain way. And maybe that's the best way he saw us and left us in that image. Besides, the Bible says he created us in his own image. No, I wouldn't like to change anything about myself. I'm happy. I thank God the way he created me with my boobs, everything. I appreciate it. So I don't see the reason why most women or some women will go in for the artificial surgery or something of that sort. For me personally, I don't see the need to. I mean, if you feel you're, you're growing fat in any part of your body, the best thing for you to do is to exercise. And one thing I've also realized is you need to believe in your soul. Somebody will be a size 8 figure, the person feels good. Somebody will be a size 14 and the person also feels good. It's about how you carry yourself. And besides, if you're going in for this, you just look at the side effects. As a human being, you need to stick to yourself and believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, that will attract you to go for that kind of surgery. But if you believe in yourself and you stick to yourself and you check your diet, I think it will work for you. So my view is not good. I, anybody would want to change her breast or face or any part of the body to please. I don't know who you want to please, maybe a man. Die and see, that man will go for another woman. Even while you are being buried, a girlfriend might be calling him on the phone. So why would you want to change your body to please a man? And who do you want to please? I don't understand. Cosmetic surgery, and then you pay a lot. I mean, you have enough money to spend while there are many investments to be done. Okay, so we're here at the plastic surgery unit at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital and I have with me Dr. Levi Ankara, who is a senior resident here to help us really understand all that there is to know when it comes to cosmetic surgery. So Dr. Good afternoon and thanks for having us. Good afternoon. Yes, yeah, so we, are, we want to know more or learn, educate us on cosmetic surgery. Is there any difference between plastic surgery and cosmetic surgery and what are the pros and cons when it comes to cosmetic surgery? Okay, so um, I think there's a bit of confusion even in medical circles as to what plastic surgery is. Um, sometimes we get patients coming in saying that they thought it was going to be we place some plastic on the leg or something. Um, the word plastic means to mold. It's a Greek word, um, which means to mold. And that's basically, in a broad sense, what plastic surgeons do. They find ways of molding the body to fit either form or function. Um, 
and in a broad sense, there are two divisions of plastic surgery. So there's reconstructive, where we try and restore form. Say, for example, you've had a, an accident in which um, part of your nose was taken off or part of your ear was taken off. That's where we try and remold or recreate a nose from your own body tissue or recreates the ear from the body tissue. So at what point would a surgeon recommend any type of uh, these surgeries to a client for, for whatever reason? It's difficult to actually say I recommend something um, because ultimately it's the patient's body and the patient's choice. So if you feel you have a problem or there's something that you don't like, the best we can do is to give you the various options on how it can be solved or enhanced. And then you make the final decision yourself. So it's difficult to say, <clears throat> I think you should get this and I think you should get that. Um, it's but for instance, if I have a breast cancer, God yes. forbid, and I maybe one of my breasts has to be taken off, mm -hmm. I would need, and I need a replacement, or I need some form of breast. Wouldn't you recommend that I get such a such a, a surgery done? I can give you the various options because, you see, even when it comes to that, there are different options of what to do. I can suggest the different options because you probably have heard of breast implants. But there are instances where we can take your own tissue and use it to create a breast. So I present the options. I can tell you which one would be best for you. But there's even the option of not reconstructing the breast in itself. So I cannot say do this and do that and I think you should get this. I can tell you that this might be the best option in your case. Why is cosmetic surgery surrounded with so much misconceptions and fears and people think it is risky, it is dangerous, it could lead to death and so on and so forth. Is it really risky as, as we think? No surgery is without risk. Um, but if you are doing surgery in a place or with a person who is not qualified to do it, then that's when your risk is higher. Now there are thousands or millions of plastic surgery procedures that take place every year all around the world in different parts of the world um, in the u.s and the uk you find lots of procedures done and even in places like brazil you do um, i think sometimes the problem comes from either the person who is getting the surgery that's the patient not not actually needing that procedure or being at higher risk of complications from any form of a procedure. And then also from a risky and, let me say, dodgy surgeon who decides to go ahead and do the procedure, probably purely for his monet monetary gains, when this patient shouldn't get the surgery. All right, so as I understand you, like every surgery is risky, but when it comes to cosmetic surgery, who uh, would be at risk of anything at any point which particular person or client or based on what conditions can one be considered to be at risk um some people have a psychological problem i think my nose is too big but really your nose is not a problem you just have some self-conscious mm. that could be sorted out by psychology not necessarily by surgery. And these are things that need to be assessed. Um, so you find out the person comes back and says, I still don't like my nose. There's a perception, or maybe we hear so much of late that people, especially ladies, want to change so many things about themselves. We want bigger boobs, bigger bums, tiny waist and all that. But is that really the case as to the number of cases that you get here? Do people really work in trying to change certain things about themselves? We've done a number of different procedures and we see um, a number of cases. We haven't probably done as much as, say, in centers outside the country. Um, but we've had a, a number of cases that we've done and good results. 
Um, every now and then you get one or two complications, but um, nothing severe. Um, we do get other cases which have been done outside where there are problems. Um, so I don't know if I don't know if there's been an upsurge because it's always about people what people want, um, and people have been doing these things flying out of the country to get them done anyway. Um, maybe the media has portrayed things in a way. I mean, we watch TV, we see people. Um, certain things are more appealing than others. So people always want to look their best. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. So what would be your final words on what we've discussed so far, especially to people who are still eager to get certain things done in, I mean, in the face of all the horrific stories that we've been hearing about cosmetic surgery? Well, um, generally, cosmetic surgery is available. There's nothing wrong per se. Um, you just need to be assessed properly. It needs to be done by a competent enough surgeon. Don't hesitate to ask your surgeon how many of these have you done? What are your qualifications? Uh, where do you train? Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And I have been speaking with Dr. Levi Ankra at the plastic surgery unit here at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. There have been a lot of education today to you when it comes to cosmetic surgery, at, at, at least uh, to make an informed decision as to whether or not you still want to go ahead with that surgery. You're still watching Captured by Women. The show continues after this break. Please stay. Well, 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 all too soon we have to bring the show to a close. We have been discussing very interesting topics right from the top. We talked about the national identification cards and the fact that there's been a halt in the process, but we hope in some times to come it will be rolled out. Then we also had an interesting discussion concerning the Obin 4 issue and the matters arising and what the law says and what the Medical and Dental Council had been doing about it prior to this unfortunate incident. Then we also touched on Anas's video, the number 12, which will be premiering on on June 6th, of course, everyone will be thronging to see what is going on. And I'm sure if you are part of it. And then we also spoke about a CEO who's doing very well in the fashion industry in the person of Selena. And she has her industry named Selena Beb. They are doing so well. I'm sure you pass by her shop to get a thing for yourself or a friend or a loved one. And then finally, finally, we wrapped up with cosmetic surgeries. Do we really need it? What are the pros and the cons? You heard from the expert there. And indeed, I hope everyone believes in themselves. Know that you as your maid is the best person you can have. Trust yourself, be happy, and go out there and live life. But we have been sponsored by Yam Vita, a delicious way to grow. And has been myself and of course, Petra. And we're saying goodbye for now. We'll see you same time next week. Have a blessed weekend. Captured by Women is brought to you by Yum Vita, a delicious way to grow.